Everyone seems to agree that we live in a crazy world. People use words like divided, contentious, postmodern, post-Christian, culture wars, embittered, among others. A while ago, people tried to describe our world through something called the secularization theory. This theory basically said that as time goes on, scientific thinking would make spirituality and religion fade away. Sociologists pretty much agree that this isn't the case. Scientific thinking has definitely had a huge impact on the world, but there are a lot of manifestations of spirituality all around us. So if there are churches and mosques and other forms of spirituality everywhere, do we really live in a secular age? James K.A. Smith's book, How Not to Be Secular, gives a compelling answer to this question. This book summarizes and comments on Charles Taylor's 2007 book, A Secular Age. Taylor's book is immense in mass and influence. The book is nearly 900 pages and weighs three pounds. Many thinkers have called it a turning point in the evaluation of the idea of secularity in our current world. Smith's book, which only weighs 7.8 ounces, shows readers with less reading time how Taylor's ideas give us a novel concept of how secularity should be understood and how Christians should engage in the world around us. Here's a brief summary of the introductory chapter to Smith's book. So how do we describe the world around us? Are we godless for not allowing prayer in school? Or on the other hand, will our failure to denounce superstitious craziness result in another 9-11? According to Smith, we're too prone to lean too heavily on religious or non-religious evaluations of what's going on. Smith suggests that we look to Charles Taylor for a more nuanced and accurate assessment. Smith uses the phrase haunting imminence to summarize the reality of how we can know there's nothing out there while also feeling like there actually might be something out there. Smith quotes the author Julian Barnes, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. This reminds me of C.S. Lewis's reflection on reading Christian poetry as a non-Christian. He loved the poetry, but didn't really understand it. He was reading with, as he says, the point left out. Because of this haunting imminence, believers are tempted to lose their faith, but also at the same time, non-believers are tempted to question their lack of faith. Smith then describes the idea of doubting transcendence. So we have believers wondering if their beliefs are actually delusions, and we have non-believers wrestling with the possibility that there actually might be something out there after all. Smith says that these lived expressions of cross-pressure are at the heart of the secular. This cross-pressure of believing and non-believing explodes into what he calls a nova effect, where imminence seems ready to implode upon itself. In other words, our world has believers who are tempted to adopt the rational world of non-believers, while non-believers are tempted to adopt the existentially rich world of believers. So in order to explain the coexistence of faithful doubters and the doubting faithful, Smith introduces the question that is at the heart of Taylor's project. According to Smith, Charles Taylor's 900-page book is really one long answer to one simple question. How is it that in the year 1500 it was unthinkable to not believe in God, but in the year 2000 it is really hard to believe in God? What happened in 500 years to move from a default condition of belief to a default condition of unbelief? Smith points out that these questions are not concerned with what people believe as much as with what is believable. Taylor is incredibly helpful in narrowing in on a useful definition of secular. Taylor outlines three ways the word secular is used. Secular one is the notion of separation. This is the idea of the sacred secular split. Even in medieval Christendom, farmers were secular and priests were sacred. Secular two is the concept of subtraction. This is the idea of advocating for public spaces that are untouched by religion. The introduction of Secular II is how we get prayer out of public schools. Taylor introduces the term Secular III not as separation or subtraction, but as a type of sinking. It's not that belief in God is really fully embraced, or only occasionally employed, or totally taboo. Rather, belief in God is only one option among others, and thus contestable and contested. At the issue here is a shift in the conditions of belief. Taylor believes Secular III's most distinctive quality is exclusive humanism, which values human flourishing above everything else. Before modernity, flourishing was measured according to external factors, which could be as simple as just the success of the tribe or as elaborate as obedience to the Trinity. 
Secular three then was ushered in by a thoroughgoing concept of meaning that measured flourishing inwardly rather than externally. Smith shows that Taylor explains this condition through telling the right story. Taylor warns against buying into subtraction stories of secularization. These are stories that tell us about how much better off we are now that we've subtracted delusional superstitions from our cultural narratives. Taylor says we didn't get here by just eliminating the enchanted dimension, but by combining elements that added up to disenchantment. Smith concludes his introduction by setting up Taylor's long historical narrative, which shows how we went from naturally believing in God to making a God out of believing in nature.